What's up, everybody? Uh, welcome into another YouTube live show. I am John Kurtz, and uh, tonight, man, we have we've got an interesting one to talk about. A bombshell in college athletics today. One of the biggest bombshells I can really remember. Late afternoon, we get word from Chris Lowe, ESPN, that the one and only Nick Saban is retiring, and it has now been officially confirmed by Alabama through a statement. That is out there. So Saban is done at Bama, and this begins an entirely new era of college football. There will be tentacles to this and ripple effects from this that will be far-reaching throughout the college football world. And we're going to begin to break some of that down here. And you know what, Mike? I don't do this often, but we do need to start the show off like this. Matt Campbell to Alabama. Let's fire up Matt Campbell to Alabama rumors here. Alabama head coach, Matt Campbell. Thank you, Mike. We did have to get that joke in. That is, that is the one time I will do that here today, uh, but we'll sneak that in because you played off the joke. Look, you guys know this is a Big 12-centric channel. As such, we're going to talk about how this will affect the Big 12 and how it will affect the Big 12. I can understand someone saying like, hey, saving big story. I understand it. I get why that is something that everybody is going to be talking about today, but what, what does it matter to me as a Big 12 fan? It matters to you as a Big 12 fan because the coaching carousel is now hot and heavy again. This is going to spin and spin and spin, and where it will stop, who knows? If you are K-State with Chris Kleiman, if you are Kansas with Lance Leipold, if you are Iowa State with Matt Campbell, if you are Oklahoma State with Mike Gundy, if you are Utah with Kyle Whittingham, if you are Arizona with Jed Fish, like hot in-demand coaches right now in college football, I'd say that you need to be a little bit concerned because it seemed like things had really died down. And and honestly, we may have been having some of these same conversations anyway because we'd be sitting around wondering, all right, like, what's going to happen with Jim Harbaugh? You know, I, I had that as a topic on my sheet for tonight because I was listening to Shahan J. Araja from CBS Sports, who's excellent one of my favorite college football reporters out there. And he was on uh, with Saran Petro on Sports Radio 810 lo locally in Kansas City yesterday. And um, he was saying he had talked to like Michigan folks around the national championship game. And they were almost kind of like resigned to the fact that Harbaugh was probably going to be leaving for the NFL. So there was already this feeling like, hey, Harbaugh may leave. And if Harbaugh leaves, that's going to kickstart the coaching carousel once again, and that will make things crazy. But yet, we have now an even bigger fish that is left. So you could potentially have Michigan and Alabama both open at the same time, depending on what it is that Jim Harbaugh is going to want to do here in the immediate aftermath of, of his national championship. And if that happens, I mean, this could get really, really wild as far as where everything is going to go. So the the, the angle here, the hook here for Big 12 fans is not, hey, Alabama is going to come after any of those coaches that I just rattled off. I, that is that is not going to be the deal. You're not going to have to worry about that if you are a fan of your school, I don't think. But that doesn't mean you should be lulled to sleep because, I mean, the rumor right now, I just saw Jason Shear tweeting about this a moment ago from the Arizona 24-7 site, who obviously is pretty plugged in in Pac-12 circles. Jason Shear was just tweeting about like, hey, the, the hot rumor right now is that Dan Lanning is going to be the guy and that they've already been somewhat down this road and it's fairly close. And OK, so if he's going to leave, then the Oregon job is going to be open. Now you're starting to work back down toward a tier where, hey, would Oregon go search for somebody in Big 12 country? If they don't, whoever they pull, that school potentially would be likely to start looking down that road. So. This is the effect that all of this can have. And uh, it's unfortunately just a reality if you are a school with an in-demand coach, with a coach that is very, very good. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about that today. I've got some funny angles uh, on the Saban stuff pulled together for you. I've got the, you know, I guess, legitimate serious list uh, from Pete Thamel of who he thinks are potential candidates, like legitimate candidates uh, at Alabama. So we can definitely talk about that, too. Um and uh, just be all over this, man. There, there's plenty outside of that. Like I had some fun stuff coming up for you today. Andy Staples at the national championship game. God bless him. He captured an incredible photo of John Canzano and uh, George Kleovkov talking to each other on the sidelines 
of the national championship game, which was quite hilarious. Um, We've got the final AP poll where Big 12 teams stand in that and uh, one AP voter that you should all be mad at because he left literally every single Big 12 team out of the AP poll except for Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, Very, very on brand. We do have the national championship game, by the way. Uh, Michigan kind of put to bed our our Washington dreams and uh, what that could mean for Big 12 schools. Javon Baker, that's a big uh, draft entry from the Big 12 with UCF losing uh, a star player there. And we even have some John Wilner updates on uh, what's going on in the Pac-12 and and uh, more importantly the uh, the Pac-2 there. But that's what I have for you, folks. We'll we'll spend a lot of time on the the Saban stuff and wherever it is that you guys want to go because you know the deal here. Uh, I can't pay attention to everything going on in the chat. Too much going on. So if you want to be a part of the show, I guess you either make a great Matt Campbell joke within the first minute when I am looking at like the first three or four comments that are in there, or you can click the dollar sign below the chat box in order to make a donation. Uh, and your donation, as always, is much appreciated. Not only does it support the channel here, but it will also ensure that you make it on the show. It pins it in a separate column for me. Shout out to StreamYard. Uh, so I can keep track of it very easily. It will ensure that you are going to be a part of the show tonight and uh, get your voice heard, control some of the content, and help support the work I'm doing to bring you Big 12 conference realignment college football content here on a week-in, week-out basis on the channel so uh appreciate all of you guys for being here if you could give me a like just like the video i would much appreciate that as well this is a very easy way uh to support the channel and a totally free way to support the channel also if you don't mind leaving a comment in the comment section of the video below the video that is much appreciated as well whether you love me hate me agree disagree are you worried about your coach uh heading off somewhere with coach and carousel back in action what is your reaction to uh, nick saban leaving all of that stuff is really, really helpful as well. So I would uh, I would much appreciate that. Also, it's john kurtz 4 on Venmo. If you would like to uh, leave a comment, question or comment there, or just support the channel there and you're not watching this live. Uh, as I would imagine, we'd have a lot of people who are not watching this live because I did start earlier tonight, just based around my schedule, trying to get it going uh, a little bit earlier. So um, yeah, anyway, that's the laundry list that I have to get out before we kick off the show here. Uh, Will, what's up, Will? Will says, hey, Bama, but nothing but respect for Saban. He is the GOAT. Uh, Yeah, I don't know how anybody could have anything but complete and total respect for Nick Saban. Um, Why on earth? Like, trolling, all that stuff, you know, you can have some fun with it. I tried to do so saying, like, hey, look, Nick Saban's last bowl win was over K-State. He got to the pinnacle of college football. He got to the pinnacle of the sport. Realized it was all downhill from there. He would never accomplish anything that great again. And uh, after a year of trying, decided, hey, I just got to hang it up. Never going to do anything. But even in that, you have to recognize the guy is the greatest to ever do it. I mean, he's in the argument for greatest coach of all time ever in in any sport. Certainly the best in college football. Seven national championships. Nine SEC championships. Um, At Alabama, he had an 88% winning percentage, which is just unreal. Uh, So, Will, I shouldn't have popped that down yet. Will, I appreciate your support of the channel. And uh, look, I totally agree with you. There's no way you can have anything but support uh, for for Nick Saban in light of this. Now, he's going to cast a hell of a shadow over this job. And he's going to that is is one thing I want to talk about here. Like, I do not think this is any easy task at all for Alabama to fill. I will give you a little story here. I popped into the uh, the Paul Feinbaum show for just a minute. And, uh, dude, fine bomb. It sounded like a freaking funeral, man. He thought you would have thought if you would have just heard him, you would have thought he was talking about Nick Saban dying. I mean, that's that's how it felt. And if I were a Bama fan, that's probably how I would be feeling today, because I don't think this is an easy job at all. I think Bama, obviously, there are resources. Obviously, it's a place with an incredible winning tradition. But you are stepping into the SEC with Georgia right on your doorstep, putting together a run that is as good or better than you. I I understand Alabama just beat them in the SEC championship game, but what Kirby Smart and Georgia are doing right now is just as good or better um, than than Saban. Now, not for as long a period of time, but they're up and running like that. So you're going to have to deal with them. Uh, LSU is stealing every SEC stud coach out there right now. Like they're literally just picking off like an all-star coaching staff from Mizzou, from Texas. They got the Texas D-line coach today. Um, so LSU certainly is going to be no peach 
uh, to deal with there in the SEC, and they've won three national championships in the last couple of decades. The fans are as spoiled as they could possibly be. I mean, can you? is there any scenario you could ever concoct where there would be a fan base more spoiled than what they are right now with Saban winning six championships there since he was the head coach? And uh, they're already going to be nuts anyway because it's the SEC. And then on top of that, I mean, you are following the greatest coach of all time, one of the greatest to ever do it in any sport, one of the greatest champions the sport has ever seen. That is an unenviable task, man. So I don't, Bomani Jones, I thought was the best at tackling this angle of the story. I know everybody wants to go into who's next and look, that's, that's the title of the video here. So I'm, I'm guilty of it too. Everybody wants to talk about that, but for Alabama, they will be able to find somebody very good, but I don't, I don't see an obvious candidate out there. Who's like, man, this is the can't miss guy that is going to be capable of dealing with everything that comes with Alabama and following Nick Saban. I don't see that guy out there. I really, truly don't. And um, that's going to make for a pretty tricky scenario here because fans, there will be discontent right away. I mean, there's discontent when they just don't make the playoff one year and you are stepping into a hyper, hyper, hyper competitive situation with all these schools, by the way, that are, are going to be throwing parties right now. Auburn, I saw Tumor's Corner. Now, Auburn should be freaking partying. Tumor's Corner, they were doing the, you know, throwing toilet paper all over the trees out there. Shout out to Harvey Updike. Um, because they're they're just ready for this to be over and uh, for, for Saban to be gone and for somebody, for somebody to try and step in and, uh, and end this. And, and bam, it, there's just no way the next coach will live up to that. They're going to get eaten alive by the fan base and the expectations and the current environment of college football. Like, I just don't see any way there's not a fairly significant step down, even if the Alabama is going to still be a very good program. And that will just make it pretty untenable for that coach. So I, I guess I would hope that you're just going to get as good a payday as you possibly can, the next coach that steps in there. Because even if you have a really high amount of success, you could very easily be run out of town just for not being Nick Saban. You'd probably want to be the guy after the guy. Um, so I think that's a really underrated part of this. Like if I'm a head coach evaluating whether or not I want to go to Bama to replace Saban, I'd be thinking about all these things, man. I would be thinking about every single last one of these things and uh, what what that's actually going to mean for me. But here's your list. Here's your list. According to Pete Thamel, he says, with no likely internal replacements at Alabama, here's a quick projected target list. Dan Lanning, Kalen DeBoer, that will, we'll do this. Dan Lanning at Oregon, Kalen DeBoer at Washington, Dabo Sweeney at Clemson, the most hilarious addition to the list, James Franklin at Penn State, uh, Mike Norvell, at Florida State and Marcus Freeman from Notre Dame uh, all come with complications and big buyouts as it's difficult to move entrenched coaches. Here are the buyouts. Dan Lanning was the most popular name right now. Brett McMurphy named him as the lead candidate. As I said, Jason Shear pointed out that the hot rumor right now is that that's already pretty far down the road. Dan Lanning, $20 million, man, a $20 million buyout. Uh, Private equity going to come into the game here at, at Bama too. Uh, I don't. Do they have the same oil guys that Texas A&M did to pay Jimbo seventy million to go away? Uh, Kalen DeBoer twelve million. That one's also very high. Uh, Dabo's seven and a half. James Franklin six. Mike Norvell four. And when I say James Franklin's a hilarious addition to this, a part of it is because I think like his agent did a phenomenal job just getting his name in in that tweet. That's great agent work. Getting to Pete Thamel and be like, hey, put my boy in here. And if you were skeptical of that and you thought that wasn't real, there was a first edition of the tweet thrown out that had all the buyouts listed. It did not include James Franklin. And then there was an edited version. You can see that it was edited. A new one stuck in there that had James Franklin's buyout. And so I saw someone pointed out like, man, yo, James Franklin's agent is working overtime on this thing. And he, he absolutely is just to get him out there. I think Penn State would help pay the buyout like Penn State fans would probably help pay the buyout to allow them to go hire a different coach and uh, go a different direction with that. So pretty funny that James Franklin gets mentioned there. Mike Norvell is, is an interesting one, but see, like, I don't, do you read that list? Does anybody read that list and say like, man, that's the guy, like that's the guy that's going to go on a dynastic run here and be able to at least somewhat legitimately succeed Nick Saban and what he's done, because I don't see that guy. Like I start going down the list, it's like Dan Lanning, I think is very good, 
But is Dan Lanning ready for that? Or have we seen enough from Dan Lanning? He's young. I think he's, I think he's got a super bright future, but it feels like this might be just a little bit too early uh, for Dan Lanning there. Would I want to turn over Alabama to Lanning for tw- especially with a twenty million dollar buyout to put that kind of investment in? I mean, if he's the guy, he's the guy. You're certainly going to go pay the money and do whatever it is that you need to do. But I, I don't know. I don't know about that one. Um, uh, Kalen DeBoer. Kalen DeBoer, I think, is really good. I, I mean, I think that's been pretty well established. That guy has won every single place he's been, and he's been a phenomenal coach. Um, I I just – his personality type does not strike me, and I'm, I'm also operating off of what John Wilner said about him, which John Wilner was kind of like, I don't know that that's really a fit that Kalen DeBoer would want to do that. And he's about to have a Big Ten job. Like, he'll have a Power 2 job at Washington – does Kalen DeBoer want to take all of that on, assuming that Washington is going to meet him where they should uh, financially, which will be interesting to watch because I don't know if you're paying attention to this, but Eli Drinkwitz at Mizzou just got $9 million a year with his latest raise. So I, what does that mean the going rate is then for Kalen DeBoer? Um, that's a pretty wild number that may be out there. But I, I think DeBoer could be very good, but I don't know about personality fit and how that works at Bama. Dabo... It, he's just washed. And when I say washed, I don't mean that like he's not a good coach anymore. He's not an elite coach anymore. He doesn't have an elite program anymore. I, I think those days are done for Dabo and Clemson. And so I think you'd be really asking for trouble there if you were Alabama. And frankly, Alabama's probably lucky that this didn't happen three years ago because they may well have hired Dabo at that point, paid a bunch of money for him, invested a ton in him. And then he would have started to slide downhill as a guy who was not really on the cutting edge of NIL and everything that you need to do to win today in college football. I mean, James Franklin, I've already kind of laughed out of the building here. Um, And like Mike Norvell kind of fits in the Dan Lanning sort of area for me. I know that he's been a head coach much longer than Dan Lanning has. I just need to see Mike Norvell do it at a super elite level at Florida State for a little bit longer before I would be confident in saying like, man, if I were Alabama and I could basically go hire almost anybody that's the type of guy i would want to turn it over to so i don't know i find flaws with all of those landing makes a lot of sense if he truly is going to be the guy uh landing does make a lot of sense i get it um but I, I i also would have some pause as to whether or not he's totally ready he's got sec ties he worked under kirby smart um he he's helped made a name for himself in the sec so like i i do understand it to uh to a point and to an extent I don't, I guess I didn't address what happened to Marcus Freeman. Yeah. Marcus Freeman. I, same thing may well have a really bright future, but I think that's way too early to be turning, uh, turning the job over to him. Th- there are two names that make a lot more sense, make a lot more sense to me. Uh, I will get to those in just a moment, but I'm going to hit up uh, some of the super chats here. appreciate all of you guys who are weighing in. If you want to be a part of the show tonight with uh, nearly 150 people in here, I can't keep track of everything going on uh, in the live chat. So, if you uh, click the dollar sign below the chat box, you can submit a donation, make your chat a super chat. It will pin it in a separate column for me and uh, is a way for your question or comment to get read, for you to be a part of the show tonight, and for you to support the work that I'm doing here on this channel. Those of you that are new into the chat, also, if you could like the video, I would much appreciate that. A totally free way to support the channel. Uh, here is 69 Chevelle. 69 Chevelle says, Saban isn't a hair on Bill Snyder's backside. Well, you are uh, a man coming after my own heart, obviously, with that. Uh, that's always one of those tough arguments. You know, Bill Snyder, how do you equate the guy who orchestrated the greatest turnaround in college football history and what he, he took K-State from to the guy who, you know, has been the best winner in college football history in Nick Saban? Totally different environments, different resources, different history. How do you equate the jobs that they did? I, I mean, I think I'm totally fine saying that, like, Nick Saban is the greatest college football coach of all time. I think Snyder deserves the respect as the greatest turnaround of all time. I mean, the sh- uh, like bullet point list on that, spark notes on that. He took over a program that Sports Illustrated the previous year wrote about as Futility U, losing his program of all time record-wise. Uh, didn't even have enough guys to have a full practice when he took over the roster. Uh, they had gone three straight years without winning a game. When he took over, I mean, it was, you know, think about how bad Kansas football was before Lance Leipold got there and then take it down maybe another half notch. That's that's what Bill Snyder inherited. Plus, in a non-transfer portal environment where it was more difficult 
to bring the kind of guys that you wanted to bring in there. And within 10 years, he had K-State ranked number one in the country. He won 11 games seven times. He won 11 games six times in a seven-year stretch. Um, undoubtedly the greatest turnaround in college football history. I always think the, the tough part is like if you were to swap them, like would Saban be able to do what Snyder did and would Snyder be able to do what Saban did? I'm not sure that either one really truly would. Uh, I don't know that it would completely work like that. I don't, you know, Bill Snyder, I don't know that his style and what he was doing back then would have really flown with like super elite talent that you would be pulling in at, uh, at Bama. So I definitely appreciate the sentiment. Obviously, I want to pay total respect to Bill Snyder, who deserves like every single bit of the respect there. And I'm sure Saban has a, a hell of a lot of respect for him, too. It's just kind of an apples to orange, oranges comparison. It's a really hard one to do. So I would kind of differentiate it like Snyder, greatest turnaround of all time in college football history. Uh, best coach at doing more with less probably than anybody in college football history. Although misnomer by late 90s, early 2000s, he had some real, real, real talent. Uh, on those teams. But yes, point taken, point taken. Uh, meanwhile, Saban, I, I would consider Saban to be absolutely the best coach in college football history. Now, John Teal brings up an interesting one. This is one of the two candidates I was going to say makes sense. Two that seem to really make sense to me, Sark, Sark, okay, which is a part of, of the discussion that would make sense here on this channel. Sark to me would make a lot of sense, and Lane Kiffin would make a lot of sense. At least Lane Kiffin strikes me as the type of guy who would he would go take the job. He's not going to shy away from the responsibility of the Alabama job and the spotlight of the Alabama job and following Saban and all those things. I don't think that would bother him at all. Uh, so I, I agree with you. Lane Kiffin could be a, I would say a good hire, a good hire. I, I would caution greats, but I think a good hire. I mean, he's doing a phenomenal job right now at Ole Miss managing the portal. Like I know that they lost Quinshawn Judkins, but then they get a really nice, uh, who was the other guy on their roster that came back? I just saw a lot of people praising him for like portal management, saying basically what had happened. They went out and spent all this money, got some great players in the portal. Sounded like Judkins then gets a little restless with what his NIL is going to be. So they lose him, but they still maintain a really good running back room. And now they've upgraded so many other positions. He seems like a guy that, that really gets it the way that you have to win in college football these days, even though he is somebody that also has kind of complained about it and grumbled about it a little bit too. But he's got the type of personality that could withstand the heat. Uh, would certainly be a lot of fun there. And he knows he knows what it's like. He's, he's literally been there. I mean, he knows what that spotlight would be like. Uh, he has experienced that for himself. So I do agree with you, John Teal. But interesting, John Teal says, I love Marcus Freeman. That's my favorite. I just, I don't know that Marcus Freeman's ready for Bama. You know, I, I still think he could be a great, great coach. I think he definitely could get to the point where he would be one of the best coaches in college football. It just feels to me like he needs some more seasoning. He's young, raw talent that just needs to go through it and get the reps. And I don't know that following Nick Saban at Alabama is the way to, to get the reps that you would really need. I mean, undoubtedly, it'd be a step up in resources and, and ceiling at Alabama than where he's at at Notre Dame. Um. But I would think maybe five years down the road, that would be a better fit. Maybe Marcus Freeman is the guy after whoever's almost inevitably going to get run out of town eventually for not being Nick Saban at uh, at Alabama. So interesting thought, though, John Teal. I definitely I respect the opinion and I, I respect and like Marcus Freeman. Uh, Travis, Travis, Ron Prince has done this before. He can do it again. Somebody had a really good tweet, Travis, that said Saban is the king. And who typically replaces a king? And then it was a picture of Ron Prince. The prince replaces the king. Uh, yes. Let's get Ron Prince back out there. Wonder what uh, wonder what he's doing. You know, he flamed out at Howard last I knew in terms of being a head coach. He had flamed out at Howard um, in pretty unceremonious fashion. So who knows? Uh, who knows how that translates to Alabama? You know, we can never know until we find out. So Let's see. Uh, Mike, what's going on, Mike? Thank you for your support of the channel. Uh, Mike says, if Freeman leaves, does that affect Notre Dame's willingness to keep the football program independent? Uh, coaches keep leaving for conference teams. Interesting thought. Interesting thought because they just lost Brian Kelly to the SEC. So if you're going to lose back-to-back uh, -back coaches to the SEC, who would maybe be feeling like, hey, this is my shot to go win a national championship, you know, I, I see where you're going with that. Maybe it has a, a, a bit of an effect. I think one of the things that was always talked about is that as long as Notre Dame could get a TV deal that would keep them financially competitive, and it sounds like they have now secured that, 
makes it much less likely for them to throw away all that tradition. And if there's one place that values or potentially overvalues tradition, uh, Notre Dame would be one of those places. So I still have a hard time seeing that being the thing that would really, after all these years and all the tradition, that would be like the one thing that totally pushes them over the edge. But that may be one piece, you know, one straw that would be on the camel's back. I don't know that it would be the one that broke the camel's back, but I think it's a, it's a really interesting point. Um, it's a really interesting talking point. I just, the Marcus Freeman getting mentioned in the Pete Thamel tweet to me feels much more again, like just a guy's agent working really well to get his client's name out there just to try and drum up some publicity for him. But no, it's a, it's a great thought. That's a great thought and a great, great potential topic. Uh, Browns and beers. What's up? Browns and beers. Uh, Browns and beers says, I like this. Browns and beers says happy retirement to former West Virginia defensive backs coach and Cleveland, Br Cleveland Browns defensive coordinator, Nick Saban. Yes, let's uh, let's raise a glass to former West Virginia defensive backs coach Nick Saban. Did an excellent job there. I saw a uh, tweet today that um, uh, what was this one that Saban at one point replaced Pete Carroll as the defensive backs coach somewhere way like in 1980. I want to say that it was and then obviously like both of those guys uh, going out today. So, uh, yeah. Now, I knew there was a West Virginia connection somewhere there with Nick Saban, so I'm glad we made that. All of our Big 12 stuff here. Last college football playoff win for Saban was Cincinnati. Last bowl win for Saban was K-State. He's a former West Virginia defensive backs coach. We, we got some Big 12 connections here with Saban. But I, the, the real thing, the real meat of this, is it concerns Big 12 fans here on the channel and those of you guys that uh, are really diehards and pay attention to the Big 12. I am about to dive full on into. I gave you some of that at the beginning, but it's going to be – Coaching carousel, what does this mean uh, moving forward for everybody else in the Big 12? So we'll get to that in just a moment. You are free, though, to continue submitting the Super Chats. If you have uh, direction you want to go, you have things you want to add to the conversation, click the dollar sign below that chat box in order to do so to attach a donation to your chat. It will pin it in a separate column, ensures that you get on. Uh, John Teal says, uh, Snyder equals Batman and Saban equals Superman, IMO. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a decent that's a decent type of comp, you know. I guess beauty in the eye of the beholder there, but I think most, you know, ninety nine out of a hundred are definitely going to side with Saban there. But I I see the point that you are making with that. I definitely definitely do. And one thing that you know, I mean, look, I don't need to be going down the nineteen ninety eight rabbit hole here, but you know, I think that was legitimately the best team in the country. K State had a team that could stake that claim in ninety eight. They were ranked number one for a nice chunk of the season. They would have played for the national championship had they not lost in double overtime in the Big 12 championship game. If that had happened and they had actually won a Big 12 or a, a national championship uh, that year for Bill Snyder, then I think you might have like some real legitimate conversation, you know, about where he would fit in terms of greatest of all time. But uh, unfortunately, fortunately, we will not get that one back. Um, all right. Rip Serwin, Rip Serwin won. Uh, I saw Ron Prince at McDonald's in 2009 eating sadly. I assume you, that he was eating sadly, and it was not that you saw him eating, comma, sadly. I'm picturing Ron Prince eating in a very sad fashion. That is the way that I would like to uh, envision that. 2009 was right after he had been fired at K-State after the 2008 season. So I like that. It's a good story. I'm also I'm definitely here for any Ron Prince stories that anybody has. Uh, absolutely 100 percent here for that. OK, so Big 12 schools, man, Big 12 schools. What do I always say when the coaching carousel heats up? I got some heat on Twitter for this. I'm trying to remember when that was within the last couple of months, maybe like November, because I said like, hey, there's this whole, you know, and, and this is maybe me be too, being too online and too involved in the the internet battles of uh, fan bases out there. But there's a lot of, you know, the Big 12 is mid, uh, you know, Big 12 sucks, like G5 conference, all these things. And it's very frustrating and amusing to me how, you know, the league gets crapped on. But then every time there is a opening, a major head coach opening or a major offensive coordinator opening, You'll get people running to Big 12 coaches. There are coaches immediately on that hot list. Um, you know, when Pete Thamel starts tweeting out candidates, there will inevitably be Big 12 coaches on that list because it's like the whole world recognizes there there are great coaches there. And then when I point that out, you know, the pushback I get as well is, see, Stepping Stone Conference, you're almost getting it. And 
with the coordinator thing, there is some truth to that. And we've seen that this offseason with Andy Kotelnicki and Colin Klein leaving from KU and K-State to go to Penn State and Texas A&M. But with the head coaches, it hasn't really worked out like that. A lot of them have stayed. Uh, Luke Fickle did leave Cincinnati right before they came into the Big 12. That was one that did leave for a Big 10 job. But there, there have not been many, and there have been so many names thrown out there over and over again. Chris Kleiman, Lance Leipold, uh, Matt Campbell, Mike Gundy. You guys know the names. All of those guys have stayed put. Like Nobody has actually left there. So they're, they're clearly very good coaches here. And even today, man, Parker Fleming, Stats of War, who's out there on Twitter. I saw him immediately throw out. He was like, hey, I know, like, basically, like, I know this won't happen, but think about it. Like, Kleiman with a bunch of elite recruiters on the staff. You know, that was, like, his brief suggestion for Alabama. And I, I, I honestly, frankly, I'm flattered because, I mean, I don't – Alabama would never uh, go take K-State's coach. Also, I don't think Kleiman would ever want to deal with the the stress – at Alabama and succeeding Nick Saban. So it's one of those where I can just look at it and be like, hey, there's a healthy amount of respect for him out there. Keegan Riano, uh, another guy who covers Oklahoma. I saw him say the same thing, like that that's something Alabama should do but wouldn't do. So I appreciate the the nod and the respect there. But the the issue here is not going to be the Alabama job. It is not going to be the Alabama job. Much as, you know, shout out to my guys, the Gambling Gauchos. It was very funny to see Matt Campbell uh, photoshopped with the Alabama gear on there as everybody continues that bit. Uh, but the issue is going to be what happens with the wild ripple of the coaching carousel if and when, well, not if, when this really gets going with whatever is going to happen at Alabama. When Bama makes a hire, it's going to pull somebody else away from a major job, which is going to pull somebody else away from a major job, and it will continue to knock down the dominoes. I guess the only way that that really wouldn't happen is if it's somebody from the NFL. And I did see a couple of names trotted out there by, well, I think it was Andy Staples had like Dan Quinn as a name, but he said he thought he will get an NFL job coming up here soon. I don't know, man. He's bringing the NFL guys back. I realize it's worked with like Pete Carroll and Jim Harbaugh. Those always just seem like head scratchers to me especially in this day and age with NIL and the portal and all the stuff that coaches are going to have to deal with. It just seems like a tough putt to me. That'd be like the one way where it's going to, you know, shut down the coaching carousel before it really gets started here. If they pulled somebody like from the NFL. Um, but beyond that, man, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be somebody that's going to set off a chain reaction here. If that is Oregon, I don't know where Oregon starts to go. I would Oregon go after Kalen DeBoer. Like, is that a realistic thing? I don't, it'd be, It'd be very fascinating to see where that would start to go. But you see dominoes falling, right? And where's Oregon going to pick their coach from? And then you're going to get into the tier. Once it gets beyond Alabama here, you will get into, in all likelihood, get into the tier of coaches that are going to be mentioning Big 12 names. Uh, unless it's like, unless it's a total shocker, unless I saw somebody, somebody mentioned Kirby Smart. You know, I've seen a couple of people float out, like, would Kirby Smart go? Would Kirby Smart be the guy to go um, if it's going to be somebody like that? Or if it is honestly the guy that I feel like makes the most sense. If I were Alabama, I would be very interested in. And I know that I was somebody that was skeptical about him up until this year. But I am a believer because he has taken the ultimate country club program, the ultimate country club atmosphere, and made it into a pretty damn tough, hard-nosed physical team that made the college football playoff this year. And that is Steve Sarkeesian at Texas. If Steve Sarkeesian or Kirby Smart, somebody like that, were to take the job, maybe like Dabo and Clemson, maybe, although I think they could maybe be shopping in kind of that Big 12 tier-ish of coaches, um, it's going to be somebody that would potentially put Big 12 schools at risk there. But I love Sark. I should get the Sark point off here because I, I got started on that and didn't finish it. One, it would be hilarious to watch Texas get it all figured out, get to the playoff, finally change their culture issues, and then the guy's like, ah, peace, I'm going to, you know. Of course, Saban retires right then. Texas finally ends 15 years of wandering through the football 7-5 and five desert, and it all gets blown up by Saban deciding to retire right then and there the same year that they beat him. Hol hilarious. I mean, I would laugh my ass off. Doesn't sound like that is going to happen, but Sark is a guy that I think could – handle some of that heat he's already been at texas and what are what are the biggest issues at texas like the biggest issues at texas are that too many cooks in the kitchen with all these donors that think they have 
reason to to have real decision making power over some of this stuff like they're you know texas is kind of like an alabama like atmosphere with everything that you would have to deal with he's already been there and done that plus guess what the guy has been a coach at alabama he wasn't the head guy but he's been at bama so he knows what bama looks like he knows how that would compare to texas and what he's dealing with at texas and he has maybe the best you know kind of one b sort of comp that you could get to what it would be like as the head coach at bama and again, to me, the most impressive thing he's done is not recruit talent to Texas, although I think he is very good at utilizing the portal. Uh, the Arch Manning recruiting win was an incredible one where he was going up against like the best of the best, Georgia, Alabama. I think he's great. I think he's modernized, fully up to speed with that. Tremendous offensive coordinator and play caller, which is what you need. You need an offense. I'd much rather have an offensive guy than a defensive guy in general when I'm starting these days in college football, and I, I know you'll tell me Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, but I, if you're giving me the choice, I'd rather have a guy that can produce offense year in, year out at any level, even if I'm hiring a coach in the NFL. Uh, 1,000%, that is the way to go in today's day and age in college football. Sark can do that. He understands the pressure. He's literally been at Bama. He's been the head coach at Texas here, handled it, and he has turned around the culture there. I have no doubt that he could – then formulate a pretty good culture at uh, Alabama. Well, I certainly have less doubt about that than I would maybe some people. I think he could handle it. I think Sark has been in the kitchen. He could handle the heat. He wouldn't have to hop out of the kitchen because he's already handled a lot of this heat already. So that would be that would be one that I think makes a ton of sense. And that would be one that then maybe would take another notch on the domino rung to fall before because, you know, who knows who then Texas goes. But that think about that. You know, if we're talking about guys like this, that's a part of the point. Who the hell knows where this is going to wind up, you know, as far as the carousel goes? Who knows, man? It's going to be all over the place. Um, this reminds me in a lot of ways of a couple of years ago when Lincoln Riley uh, left all of a sudden, and it was this just fascinating and and out of left field kind of move in college football that had the world stop college football world stopped dead in its tracks. Now, when Venables then took the job that stopped a little bit of, of the coaching carousel stuff when it's a coordinator. Um, but you see, you see where I'm going with this. If I were, I, I don't know if I were Iowa state, I would be all like, if you want me to, so I can go down the line here, big 12 coaches, I'm using big 12 coaches kind of as a whole to lump them together and saying like, Hey, you should be on high alert. And even if you're just a fan of the conference, be on high alert because not only do you want to keep good coaches around the league for the sake of having good football in the big 12, you also want to try and fight this reputation of being a stepping stone league. And I would argue to you that the big 12 has done a good job of avoiding that with the head coaches. They have not been super willing to jump to a lot of these jobs. They've decided to stay. How many jobs has Matt Campbell been mentioned with over the years? That's the reason that it's a bit. That's the reason that it's a joke. Chris Kleiman and Lance Leipold have now gone through it for back-to-back -back off seasons here where they've been highly, highly coveted and haven't seen them actually jump anywhere. Um, but it, you don't want that to start to become a thing. You know, you don't want there to be more Luke Fickles and uh, the reputation of the league to take a hit and then the football uh, to take a hit actually in the league too. And then two that I would surface, I, I really am surprised that I've not, I haven't really heard Jed Fish mentioned all that much for other jobs like jed fish just finished 11th in the country that final ap poll came out jed fish just finished 11th in the country at arizona 11th in the country at arizona this year took over a disaster of a program kyle winningham has just been a bedrock of consistency at utah and maybe he's i should look up the age of kyle winningham is he like getting to the age where maybe he wouldn't want to leave kyle winningham wiki uh 64 so yeah i mean maybe he's kind of like in that chris climbing range and i don't i don't really foresee him leaving i guess that's uh, oh climate's 56 man i forget that climate's so much younger i guess it's just i operate off the assumption i don't think climate wants to do it super duper long so i can go make a case with each one of these coaches why they would stay like climbing nebraska definitely pursued him they went after matt rule he kind of said no they pursued some guys Came back to rule. They were able to get him to take the job. You know, Lance Leipold, there were rumors, obviously, about Wisconsin. Uh, Nebraska being in the mix there, and he didn't go to those. Michigan State this year was the other one. That never really surfaced. Hard to know how much interest there really was from those schools at pursuing a Lance Leipold, but he has stayed put. 
uh, so far through all this. Matt Campbell has been the ultimate case study in that, where he had a chance to take a, a number of jobs and never actually did, and that includes the NFL. Mike Gundy, there's always been some flirtation. Gundy's one where I could... I wouldn't be as shocked as I think some would if he made like some crazy move all of a sudden that you didn't expect. I wouldn't say that that's the the leader in the clubhouse on what I think Gundy will do. And I would expect that his career ends at Oklahoma state, but he's one that's been quirky enough. And uh, you know, things he has had some ups and downs seemingly in the relationship with Oklahoma state at points before it's just been a minute. Um, Kyle Winningham, like I said, he's been doing it at Utah for so long. He is in his mid-60s. I don't know that that would work out to where there'd be a job that he would want to leave for that would also want to, to be going and getting him at that stage of his career. But clearly, he's just a hell of a football coach. I mean, just an awesome, awesome football coach. Jed Fish is one. I'll, I'll be flat honest. I just don't feel like I know enough about Jed Fish and what the situation there is, how attached he would be to Arizona, what the support is going to be like for him at Arizona and uh, how all of that would go down. But as a whole, this is a group of pretty coveted coaches. So again, I just bring it up to say, keep your eye out. This is now putting everybody on high alert. It's kind of like I would equate this to, if you're talking about a storm you, you know, around here in the Midwest, truck stop conference, baby, truck stop Ville, USA. We know full well about like tornado warnings, tornado watches. You know, first you get the watch, which is just, hey, conditions are ripe for this to happen. Then you would get the warning, which is, hey, we've actually seen like rotation, like tornadic activity here. Now it's a tornado warning. I'm putting it at watch. I'm putting it at watch. Like the conditions now in the college football world are ripe to where threats could occur uh, for Big 12 coaches to be poached. Would not say a warning. We don't even know what jobs are going to be open. We don't know how this is going to actually tick off. We don't know if Alabama goes totally off the board and doesn't take a sitting college head coach number of things. And maybe Jim Harbaugh does decide to return to Michigan, but Harbaugh had already almost put me into watch mode on this. And now Saban is like slam dunk that home. So we are definitely in coach poaching watch mode as of right now. Uh, If you want to weigh in on the conversation tonight, you can do so by clicking the dollar sign below the chat box. That is how you can attach a donation to your chat, make it a super chat, which will put it in a separate column for me. Uh, over 175 people in here. I can't keep track of everything going on in the regular chat. So that is your way uh, to make your voice heard tonight on the show and uh, support the work that I'm doing to bring you Big 12 content on a week-in, week-out basis. You can do that as well on Venmo at john kurtz four. Very easy way uh, to do that and support the channel there. Plus, if you leave a question or comment, I will read it uh, on the next live show. So you can also make your voice heard that way. Uh Arturo, what's up, Arturo? Good to hear from you, man. Arturo says, what about Mike Vrabel uh, or any of the recent head coaches let go from the NFL uh, to take the Bama job? Well, I mean, I think Vrabel is a really good coach, but because of that, I think he's going to get another NFL job. And, like, I don't – the Chargers job is open. Uh, Raiders – yeah, there, there are some, I think, more interesting NFL jobs open than a typical offseason – so I just have a hard time seeing that Vrabel would want to drop down and deal with NIL and deal with uh, the transfer portal and everything that's taking place in college football right now, which is a legitimate question to ask. Like, would Saban still be doing this if it weren't for all the changes and how wild things are right now in the world of college athletics and specifically college football? So do I think it could work potentially, especially if you get just some experienced recruiters around him? I don't – does Vrabel – let's look up Vrabel – Wiki. Does Vrabel have in his background any college experience? That's what I was going to look up as, as far as a coach. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. So he spent three years at Ohio State as the linebackers coach and defensive line coach, then jumped to the Texans and the Titans. Um, so he's got a little bit of it, but that was a totally different world back then. So that was 2011 to 2013. That was a totally different environment and what you're having to deal with and the BS that you're putting up with as a – as a coach at that point, but I, you know, maybe I think it would be, would have a chance to be successful. It would be a sexy name. And I do think Vrabel is a guy that knows ball, you know, if we just want to boil it down to that. I think Mike Vrabel definitely knows ball, but I, I think he will get an NFL head coach. I think he's going to be pretty coveted in the, the NFL world. Um, uh, who, you know, like Pete, Pete Carroll, obviously I think too old at this point, probably to be involved there, even though the guy, 
is just like an ageless wonder. He certainly doesn't look it, uh, but I would not expect anything like that. Who else do we have? NFL head coaches have been fired. I'm not, I'm not the best on the NFL. So we got six jobs open. Um, Oh, Arthur Smith out. Uh, Ron Rivera. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. None of these names are doing much else for me, Pete Carroll. So decent thought. I understand where your head's at is 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 on that one. I, again, I would mention Dan Quinn was was thrown out by Andy Staples on his like kind of hot board of Alabama candidates potentially there. So maybe keep an eye on somebody like that too. You know, not just somebody who's been recently let go in the NFL. Uh, what's up, Alan? Thank you for being here, Alan. I appreciate you, and it's great to hear from you, as always. Alan says, hi, John. Uh, watching KU trying to find a way to lose the UCF. Are they? Is that really happening? I saw that the line was only like six and a half on that game, and I was like, dude, I don't, I just watched UCF get blitzed. Wow, that is a four-point game with five minutes left. Golly. Okay, maybe I need to, like, if I had my phone in here, I might pull that up on my phone to just catch – the last couple of minutes here. That is insane. I know because I mean, UCF just got decleated by K state at home. Now it's much different playing home on versus on the road at big 12 games. And I understand KU gets everybody's best, best shot uh, when they're going on the road somewhere. I saw that there was supposed to be a sellout at UCF for that. And it's their first opportunity, you know, to get a big 12 team coming there and it's Kansas. So there is a lot. It's I, I am not silly enough to think, that that's some sort of transitive property win or anything like that. It is much different, but also you are right. There is time for bill self to work his magic, man. There is time for bill self to work his magic. Absolutely. Um, and I would guess, I, I wonder what you could get like for uh live odds right now on Kansas to win the game down 57, 53 with five Oh nine left. I mean, if it were now in field house, it would be crazy to even list Kansas as the underdog for the game at that point. Um, who are your top three candidates to replace Saban? Look, I guess I would have to break it into like most likely versus who I would want. I would put Sark at the top of my list. I think of guys as of right now, which I understand. I fully embrace and understand. I was a guy that was kind of a Sark hater and skeptic, skeptic, maybe more, not really a hater so much as a skeptic going into this year, but he proved a ton to me this year with what he did and how he did it. I like Sark. I actually do kind of like Lane Kiffin, certainly for my own self-interest. The entertainment value of Lane Kiffin being the head coach at Alabama would be fabulous. Uh, so there is that that I definitely enjoy too. And then, you know, I guess Dan Lanning and, and what I think like in reality will happen. I think Dan Lanning is probably number one. It sure sounds like that. That's the industry buzz right now. I'd go Dan Lanning. Oh, bring up the Thamel tweet again. I just didn't feel great about any of these guys. Maybe I'd throw like Kalen DeBoer on my fourth list of like guys that I, I would want if I were a Bama fan right now. I might just go like Dan Lanning and then two and three, like just off the board, things that we're not seeing right now from Bama where they might surprise us a little bit. Um, that's kind of what I'm feeling now. This may be a little bit of a cop out, Alan. I try not to cop out too much, but. That's a teeny tiny bit of a cop out there. Allen does also see great to see uh, Oklahoma State, K-State, and KU in the AP Top 25. Rock Chalk Jayhawk Allen. Well, I appreciate you, Allen. And uh, I will let you get back to uh, to watching the Hawks there. And uh, everybody here, I'm sure, very interested in that game. I may have to go back and like watch some of that game uh, taped to see how exactly that happened. Uh, oh, the AP poll is what I was going to bring up. So your final AP poll, Texas finished third. Uh, Arizona finished 11th. So out of the new Big 12, Arizona is the highest finisher. This is a big part of why I would anticipate they're probably going to be the preseason pick to win the Big 12 by a lot of people. They're going to end the year on the high with beating Oklahoma, who finished 15th, and then finish higher than anybody else ranked there. And they're returning 18 of 22 starters, including the quarterback and the receiver uh, that clearly make that thing go. So... Arizona, get ready for a lot of hype, I would imagine. Uh, Oklahoma State finished 16th, K-State finished 18th, and Kansas finished 23rd, which seems about right. Yeah, I mean, that that all seems about right. I can't complain too terribly much with any of that outside of maybe dropping Oklahoma behind an Oklahoma State or a K-State. But when you're getting down into that, like in the teens, I don't know. Nothing that gets me 
fired up enough to be like ranting and, and raving about it for sure. Uh, Will, what's up, Will? Will says ESPN paid all that money for an SEC without saving. They sure did. And, you know, I would love to make fun of ESPN and kick a little dirt in their face or whatever, but they're going to be just fine. Uh, they, they did just, uh, well, the report is if you saw my video from earlier today, I guess this is a nice way to promo the video that I put out earlier today. If you did see that, uh, ESPN reports that ESPN is likely to win the rights to broadcast the college football playoff for the six years after the next two, when the contract is up, it was like Pete Thamel reports that ESPN ESPN's Pete Thamel reports that ESPN will likely get the uh, the rights to the college football playoff, but ESPN declined to officially comment. I was just like, I, you know, great sign of the times of where we're at in college football right now, where ESPN controls all of that. No conflicts of interest involved in any of that at all, ever. Like, of course not. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I think ESPN is going to be all right, but it does devalue it a little bit. It does devalue it a little bit. And if Alabama is going to take a tumble in a fall, Maybe it's a bit of a power vacuum for somebody else in the Big Ten, but in in all reality, it's probably more of like a power vacuum situation where like then LSU rises back up, right, in the West. If Bama's going to falter a little bit and Georgia's going to keep it rolling, maybe LSU then becomes the year-in, year-out power in the West. They certainly seem poised to, and, and like I said, they've done a hell of a job hiring coaches this offseason and poaching basically an SEC all-star roster uh, of head coaches. Joe, what's up, Joe? Uh, Joe says, it'll be really interesting to see what direction Alabama goes. It sure will, Joe, and I appreciate your support of the channel. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. If you guys have something, just a couple minutes left in the show tonight, make sure you click the dollar sign below that chat box in order to get your thought in. If you want a buzzer beater, you want to get a buzzer beater in before I exit the show today, now is the time to do it. If you could like the video also, much appreciate that. Totally free way to support the channel. Leave a comment in the comment section underneath. Uh, who do you think Bama should go higher? Love me, hate me, agree, disagree, all of that stuff. Totally fine and welcome in the comment section of the video because it does help with that YouTube algorithm. Yeah, man, it will be fascinating. It will be fascinating to see where Alabama goes with this. Unless I, the one that wouldn't, it, it will still be very interesting, but the one based on just the, what the buzz is in the coaching world right now and in the sports media world, if it's Dan Lanning, that would be least of which on that list because he was the name that immediately surfaced. Like Brett McMurphy, before I even saw Pete Thamel's list that did include Dan Lanning, Brett McMurphy had put that out there that he was expected to be the leading candidate there. Um, but I do think you will see a changing of the guard no matter who it is going to be. I just don't see like the the perfect kind of candidate out there. I guess the irony in this too, I realized I said earlier, when we were talking about NFL coaches. I was like, hey, I don't love these NFL coaches in college. Like, is that really something you can trust with that really? And like, dude, you realize where Nick Saban came from, John, right? Now he had college experience before. Yes, but they, they did pull him from the NFL. So I under, I understand that. Uh, I understand. I understand what I'm saying there. All right, Robert, Robert may be taking us out here. Robert says, uh, go tech beat K state on Saturday. That should be a fun one, man. Tech and K state both off to two and zero starts in the big 12. Now tech, uh, has beaten Texas on the road. I do think Texas is mighty overrated by still being in the top 25. I don't know that they're a top 25 team based on what they've done so far, but that doesn't take away from that being one hell of a win for Texas Tech. And I think they're a very good team right now. A uh, lot to be proud of and happy with and optimistic about if you are Texas Tech and what Grant McCaslin has done so far. So, yeah, I'm 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 not super optimistic about K-State winning the game. Their 2-0 start has been against UCF and West Virginia. But one of those was on the road, and K-State's won the two games by an average of 19.5 points a game. So they have blown out both teams, and that's probably what you should do against the, the bottom of the league if you're going to be a tournament team in the Big 12. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Hey, K-State's playing better ball, man. They seem to be figuring some things out. They also seem to, like, play up or down to their competition. So Tech's a pretty big game on the road. Maybe that means that they'll be up for it. Uh, they just they had you know they went to overtime with Oral Roberts. They went to overtime with North Alabama. Barely beat Chicago State. It was like all these bye games in the non-conference schedule. They just scared the living you-know-what out of you. Um, and so that's what really had it feel. It, we were talking about it earlier today on the Three Mile Podcast. Like It felt like they lost a bunch of those games, but they didn't actually lose them. They found a way to win. So they're in perfect position still to make the tournament. And uh, the 2-0 start to Big 12 play has been very nice. One last check on the Kansas game. 59-57 UCF. 
I also feel like I'm about to sneeze here, which is like the worst feeling in the world. So I guess that's probably my cue to get out. Thank you all for joining me a little bit earlier tonight to help me make it work with my schedule. Please like the video on your way out. Uh, leave a comment in the comment section. John dash Kurtz dash four on Venmo. If you didn't catch it live and you want to leave a question or comment there to be read on the next show, or you just want to support the channel and support the work that I'm doing to bring you big 12 content. All of that is much appreciated. Um, take care, have fun, tell your friends and family, word of mouth, social media, wherever it is that you talk to folks, let them know about the channel. Let's continue to grow this thing and make this community even better and better. Appreciate all of you guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for hanging out. And I will talk to you soon.